Okay, folks, so this is going to be a shorter video because we don't have as much to cover. All right, so what I want to do is, is I want to just go over the parts of the bone chapter that we didn't get to in lecture on Thursday. Remember, the next time we meet again in person on Thursday, what day is that? Thursday, February 2nd, we have our first exam, our first lecture exam. It will cover the introduction, introduction chapter, terminology and human motion, and this bone chapter. It will include some multiple choice, but some short answer. You should be studying um, precisely what we review in these videos and what we talked about in class. If I didn't talk about it, it won't be on the test. There are some things that I said, make sure you know this, but we didn't spend a lot of time on it and you still need to know those things. So for example, all the terminology, anterior, posterior, medial, lateral, those things you do need to know. As it's a review and as it's basic memorization, I'm asking you to just make sure you know those on your own. Okay, so what's left of this bone chapter? Well, at the beginning, there is a review of some basic bone structure. So I just want to remind you of some basic things. You are responsible for knowing these. So remember, the central shaft of the bone is called the diaphysis. The diaphysis is made up mostly of compact bone. So if we look at the diaphysis, it's lined on either side with compact bone for strength. The inner hollow cavity is called the medullary cavity that is filled with yellow bone marrow. This is all a review, nice and straightforward. The yellow bone marrow as an aside is a place where we can store fat a certain type of fat. And then on the ends, we have the epiphyses. So the ends of the bones are the epiphyses, the proximal epiphysis and distal epiphysis. The way that I remember that, you know, the, the word epiphysis starts with an E and I think about starts with an E, which means it is on the end. The epiphyses are made up of spongy bone. Okay. So start off nice and simple. Now, we are gonna go a little bit more detailed into the compact bone. So here we are zooming in on an area of compact bone. We're still in, we're still in the diaphysis. I know it's close to the epiphysis, but we're still in the, still in the diaphysis. So this is compact bone. The primary feature of this compact bone are these vertical cylinders called osteons. So each area of compact bone is composed of, side by side, these vertical pillars. Here's one, but it goes all the way down. Here's one, it goes all the way down, and so forth. So we have these vertical pillars that are what make up compact bone. Each vertical pillar is called an osteon. Inside the osteon, so if we're looking just at an osteon, so we're looking just at an osteon, that vertical cylindrical column, each osteon has a central cavity. This central cavity inside of each osteon, you can see a little hole in the center, the center of each osteon has a cavity called the haversian canal for blood vessels. I'm not going to ask you to label the structure of bone on our lecture exam, but I can certainly ask you questions about it using words. So you should absolutely know the, know the structure. So we're talking about each osteon, right? Each vertical pillar. The central hole is called the haversian canal. If we look at each osteon, it is made up of these little lines. Do you see these lines? See those lines? Each oste the osteon is the whole cylinder, but making up that cylinder are those lines, right? And each of those lines is a ring of collagen. 
So imagine I'm drawing those rings of collagen here. Those rings of collagen are called lamellae. I think there should be an E in the middle there. Sorry, lamellae. So these rings of collagen are lamellae. Collagen is our strongest protein fiber strength. The rings of collagen are called lamellae. But altogether, when we put several rings of collagen or several lamellae together, we form the whole darn osteon. So the whole thing that I've put in green here is the osteon, the vertical cylinder. But the osteon is made up of these circles of collagen called lamellae. Lining, let me just go ahead for one minute here. Let's see. This is another way of looking at it. So you might like to see the osteons this way. This is one osteon, one vertical cylinder. Here is another. But why I like this view is because it shows you the osteon the whole way down, right? There's one osteon, right beside it is another. They literally line the entire length of the compact bone. We can see over here the rings of collagen called lamellae. So here's one lamellae or ring, lamella or ring of collagen. Here's another ring of collagen and another ring of collagen. The rings of collagen are called lamellae. When we put, we put those rings of collagen together, they form the entire vertical cylinder called the osteon. Again, the central hole in the center of each osteon is called the Habersian canal for blood vessels. Last thing that I would like to point out are the mature bone cells. See these little amoeba-shaped dudes squished in between the lamella, lamellae? Are osteocytes. So these are osteocytes. When we look at a histology picture, these dark things, they're actually the osteocytes. So the cells that line the lamellae are osteocytes mature bone cells. Review, 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 folks. Okay? Let me talk a little bit about the epiphysis. If I go back, remember the epiphysis is made up of spongy bone. Spongy bone it doesn't have that organized arrangement. Remember, compact bone is made up of these vertical pillars or cylinders called osteons that are organized with rings of collagen and so forth. Whereas the spongy bone is just an unorganized network, isn't it? So the unorganized network, the unorganized network making up spongy bone is called trabeculi. For some reason, I'm having a hard time spelling today. Trebek, you lie. So the unorganized network of bone making up spongy bone is called trabeculi. And then filling the spaces in between the trabeculi would be the red bone marrow. I guess I can use red here. <coughs> Excuse me, pardon me. I'll use red. So filling in the gaps between the trabeculi would be the red bone marrow. And again, that is where we produce our blood cells, red bone marrow. <laughs> I'm having a hard time today. My apologies. So in the spongy bone, spongy bone is what makes up the epiphysis or the ends of the bones. The spongy bone is composed of this unorganized network of bone tissue called trabeculi filling in the gaps between that unorganized network of bone tissue of trabeculi, filling in the spaces or gaps is red bone marrow. <sighs> Excuse me again. All right, I'm just looking at my notes to make sure, because I want to make sure we cover everything. Okay, I am going to come back to that. All right, good. I already talked about in lecture the epiphyseal line or the growth plate. The epiphyseal line or growth plate is right here. It's basically the junction between the epiphysis and diaphysis. But if you recall, we said that bone grows in the womb, in a fetus, and in, in children. Bone grows from the center out, right? In endochondral ossification, 
It starts in the center, bone overtakes the cartilage from the inside towards either end, and then we develop a secondary ossification in the epiphysis, which starts to lay down bone from the epiphysis in. The last place where new bone is laid down is called the epiphyseal line. This is the last place to harden. Once it's hardened, our growth plate is said to have closed. No more increase in length in bones can occur. All right. Good. Um, make sure you review the different types of bones. Be able to give an example of each. The femur is a long bone. Folks, most of our bones are long bones. It's the most common. It's long. <laughs> an example of a short bone. An example of a short bone would be a carpal bone. The bones of the wrist are kind of like little pebbles, but they're short, they're not long. An example of a flat bone would be the sternum because you know, it's flat. And then an example of an irregular bone would be a vertebra because it's irregular in shape. So be able to define these short, long, flat, irregular and give an example in the body of each. All right, good. If you're following along in your notes, which I hope you are, I've just gotten down to letter D, individual bones and bone markings. You don't need to know these now. I might bring up some bad memories for you, or maybe they're good, I don't know. You know, greater trochanter, olecranon process, styloid process, all these fun little bumps and projections. We don't need to know those now, however, when we go through each part of the body, I am gonna be asking you to recall some of them from your anatomy class, because it's gonna be important to our discussion. But right now you don't need to know any individual bones and or bone markings. We talked about in-person intramembranous ossification. This is how only bones of the skull and clavicles are formed. We spent more time talking about endochondral. This is how all the other bones, with the exception of the flat bones of the skull and the clavicle, all other bones are formed from a cartilage model. And then slowly over time, bone replaces cartilage. That is called endochondral ossification. I talked about appositional growth. We talked about that in lecture. Even though, you know, once we finish puberty and our epiphyseal lines or growth plates close, our bones can no longer grow in length. So most of us, well, I can only speak for myself. I am definitely after puberty. <laughs> but um, even though we're post-puberty and we can't grow our bones in length, we can certainly make them a little bit thicker. And when bones grow in width, it's called appositional growth. Make sure that you review that. We're constantly, I mean, folks, it's like any tissue in the body, a muscle tissue, a bone tissue, the tissues that line the inner lining of your stomach, your skin, you know, our tissues have a certain lifespan. Our cells have a certain lifespan and then they die and then we replace them with new. And it's no different in the bones. Bones, however, live a little longer Usually a bone cell can live for a couple of years, right? But I just want to make you, I want you to understand that bone cells are constantly being generated to lay down new bone. And then at the same time, old bone is being broken down and discarded. This is remodeling. We always want to get rid of the old non-functioning bone tissue and replace it with new. I think the A&P textbooks say that usually we've replaced every part of a bone within like seven years. You don't need to know that, but that's just FYI. What types of cells produce bone versus break it down? Make sure you review the osteoblasts build new bone tissue and the osteoclasts break it down. In a healthy adult, in a healthy adult, we want these to be equal. However many bone cells get broken down by the osteoclasts, we want to build the same number back. So if we have 10 osteoclasts doing their thing, we want to lay down 
new tissue with 10 osteoblasts should be equal. How does that change following an injury? So it should be equal in a healthy adult, but what about following injury? Let's say someone just broke a bone. If someone just broke a bone, we're probably going to have more osteoclast activity. Our osteoclast activity is going to be greater than the osteoblast. Initially, following injury, we have more broken down bone because it got injured, so we got to get rid of that. So initially, following injury, we're going to have more osteoclasts. However, later, when your tissue is rebuilding, then we're going to have more osteoblast activity. I'm not so worried about that, um, this part, but I would like you to know in a healthy adult, for however much bone tissue we break down, we should be building a similar or the same number of new tissue. So the rate of osteoclast to osteoblast activity should be the same in a healthy adult. Good. Now we're moving on to Roman numeral number three, response to stress. I'm hoping that you had this in anatomy and physiology. If not, we're going to get it again. And this is really important for our discussion. When we look at compact bone. Remember, compact bone is what lines the diaphysis. And that compact bone is made up of these vertical pillars called osteons. Because of the alignment of these, because these osteons are so long, they go the entire length of the bone. Because these osteons are so long, Compact bone is very strong. It's very, it can withstand. It's very strong in this direction and can withstand compression forces. Tension to. So these are the types of forces that the compact bone can handle. So it can handle or withstand a lot of compression or tension. I mean, why do we have such a long femur with these long osteons? Because we have a lot of body weight coming down. The example I give is this picture on the top right. You know, if we have a big building, you see these pillars? Don't we want these to give strength in this direction? Yes, we want it to be able to hold the building up. So the compact bone is very strong to compression and tension forces. On the other hand, because it's more geared towards handling compression tension, it's relatively weak to a shear force. So it's strong and can withstand a whole lot of compression and tension, but it is weak when it comes to shearing or side to side forces. If I wanted to break this building down with a big piece of heavy machinery, you wouldn't, you wouldn't use your machinery and try and break it down by using force this way because it's strong to that way. So how would I ultimately destruct this? I would put a force this way because I know that the compact bone or this structure is weak to side-to-side -side forces. In this picture, that's why these arrows are short. These arrows being short are representing that the compact bone is weak, short, weak to side to side, but the compact bone is strong to compression and tension. And now we just turn the page, right? The, epi the epiphyses, and I actually should make these a little bit longer. Um, okay. Okay. The epiphyses, or the ends, are very strong to side to side, or like a spiral force. So the epiphysis, that spongy bone, the trabeculi, is very strong, can withstand 
more significant shearing or side to side forces. On the other hand, the epiphysis and the spongy bone is weak to compression and tension. Which is fine. I mean, we our bones are made this way for a reason. We get our extreme compressive strength from the compact bone. It withstands the weight of our body every time we take a step. So we get our brute compressive strength from the compact bone. But what about when we pivot, change direction, run to the side, spin, whatever, get hit from the side? We also want to have some strength to the shearing forces. And this comes from the epiphysis. <clears throat> sometimes this is described as the ability to give a little bit. So sometimes we can say the spongy bone has the ability to give or has a little flexibility. <clears throat> now, I'm not talking about flexibility like cartilage. We're not going to see the bone bend 50 degrees. But when we have this side-to-side -side force... The, the epiphysis can actually like bend down just a little. Because it's not as strong overall, it does give us some benefit in being a little bit weaker because it can give. So here we have the best of both worlds. The strongest structures in the body, the strongest structures in the real world have both strength and a little give, right? Think about bridges. They have strength, but they also have to have a little give. Okay, good. Okay, moving on here. Make sure that you can identify Wolf's Law. Wolf's Law simply states that bone grows and remodels according to the stress placed upon it. This means when you initially lay down bone tissue when you're growing, but it also means when you fracture a bone and you do rehab later in life. Bone will always grow and or remodel according to the stress placed upon it. The easiest example, even though it's unpleasant, easiest example I can think of would be um, foot binding that used to be done in ancient Chinese culture, although I think it may still happen today a little bit, which is really sad. But... Apparently, small feet was a thing that was thought to be beautiful, so the, the powers that be would purposely put little girls in shoes that were too small for them so it wouldn't allow their bones to grow, right? And they had horribly misshapen feet, couldn't walk, had a lot of other problems, but, you know, just so it's more beautiful to the men. Hmm. But sure, when we confine... Even a growing kid, when we confine a young girl's foot to a shoe that doesn't allow it to grow, well, bone's going to grow in response to that stress. It has nowhere to go, so it's just going to grow up or it's going to try and do whatever it can. We already talked about this, which is great. So remember, make sure that you can draw and point out and label the parts of this curve in general, as we did, but also... Understand that this general one that we've now introduced is the load deformation curve for bone. The one thing that I wanted to point out about this, because we are going to go back uh, in future chapters and compare muscle and ligaments, something that was that is unique about the bone load deformation curve is it has a relatively small plastic region. It may not look like it on this graph, but we'll see it when we compare it to muscle and ligaments. Of course, muscles and ligaments can stretch more, which also means that muscles and ligaments have a greater plastic region. We can tear some muscle fibers. We can tear some ligament fibers and have permanent damage, but then the overall structure is still intact. Not as true for bone. Remember, the plastic region is the area where some permanent deformation occurs, but it's before the ultimate failure point. So in the plastic region, some 
we apply a load, some permanent deformation occurs, but there's no ultimate failure. That's the plastic region. This is small in bone. There's a little bit of a plastic region, but by and large, if we have a load that causes some deformity in bone, we reach the failure point very quickly and it fractures. That is just the nature of it. Okay, moving on here. So not that much left in reality. I wanted to talk a little bit about bone healing. You can see on your notes, I just put bone healing because, because we already talked about endochondral ossification, it turns out that there's really not a whole lot for us to discuss when it comes to bone healing. So when we have a fracture or an interruption in bone tissue, check out this picture on the far left. It used to be an intact bone, but, uh-oh, we have some kind of fracture. Ah! <laughs> so now, you know, it looks like that. That's pretty wide, but you see the point here. So whenever we have, whenever we have an interruption in bone tissue, well, first of all, there will be swelling. So you should have an idea about these steps. The first thing that happens when we have a fracture in the bone, an interruption to bone tissue, is swelling. There are blood vessels running through the bone. So when you sever that, you are going to have swelling. These blood vessels are now exposed, and these blood vessels are now going to spew out their contents, hematoma. And actually, that swelling has kind of a good purpose in that it makes the person less likely to want to move it. So even though it's a natural reaction, it has a benefit in that it's, it's our body's way of naturally telling us to immobilize, don't move it. The remaining steps are basically a repeat of endochondral ossification. They're a repeat of how these bones formed in the first place. It's a repeat of how these bones formed in the first place, right? It worked so well the first time around. Your body doesn't see a need to reinvent the wheel. So how did we do it in endochondral ossification? Well, we started by a cartilage model. So when we have that disruption to the bone, what we do is, is we temporarily fill it with cartilage. We form this fibrocartilaginous, the fancy word is callus, but we fill the region with cartilage. Producing real bone takes time, and it just so happens that we can more easily plug the gap in the short term with cartilage, which is how we started in the bone. It wasn't even bone, it was cartilage to begin with. And then we slowly replace that cartilage with bone. We re slowly replace that cartilage with bone. And you can see when we first lay down bone, it is spongy bone. So we first replace it with spongy bone. And this is actually true of endochondral also, ossification in the first place. I didn't really talk about it, but here it's important. So we had the swelling because we broke blood vessels. Then we immediately fill the gap with cartilage. And then we repeat how we built the bone in the first place. We slowly replace that cartilage with bone. We first replace it with spongy bone. And then in the remodeling, areas where it is going to become compact, we lay down that final bone tissue in line with the line of stress. And when I say final bone tissue, it's often compact. 
and we lay down that new bone in the line of stress that we place upon it, which is a good thing. That's Wolf's Law. We want, and this is how we can think about rehab or coming back from an injury. If you just fractured your bone and you're in the hematoma phase, should you be putting weight on it and running around? No. We want to give the body the chance to heal at first. So when you're, when you're in the first phase or the second one, you want to keep it immobilized. You want to let the body put, lay down this cartilage. Here, we can start to do a little bit of maybe muscle contraction around the injured area, but we absolutely want to remodel. I mean, this is true for any kind of surgery. I mean, we've learned we need to give a little bit of rest to let the beginning steps occur, but usually sooner than later, we want to do some motion, some activity, and part of that is because we want the final bone tissue to be laid down in the line of stress. That means that it will be stronger. All right, folks. See? Good stuff. Okay. A um, couple things here. I'm going to move quickly through the end. You don't have to know that much in reality. First of all, I want to point out a fracture is the same thing as a break. It's not like one is worse than the other. Anytime we interrupt the bone tissue... Anytime we interrupt the bone tissue, it is fractured and or broken. I'd like you to know what? One, two, three, four. I'd like you to know four different types. When we de define these, displaced or non-displaced, a displaced fracture, displaced, means that the bone edges are no longer aligned. Look here, this is a displaced fracture. The bone edges are no longer aligned, <laughs> obviously. One part of the femur is over here, and the other part of the femur is over here. So they're no longer in line with each other. A non-displaced fracture means that the bone edges are still aligned. So there might be a bone, and the fracture is right there. It's still fractured, but the bone edges are still aligned. They're still facing each other and aligned. A stress fracture is a very small, almost a micro fracture. This is going to be a result of chronic trauma, chronic stress. This is a bone scan. A lot of times the stress fractures don't show up on an x-ray because they're so small. So a bone scan would more likely, these hot spots are in indicative of stress fractures. An avulsion fracture, that picture kind of came out weird, huh? It's like psychedelic pink and green. <laughs> in an avulsion fracture, a piece of bone is pulled off or pulled away. You know, I tend to use general terms sometimes. So in this picture, what color should I use? Maybe I'll use white. That's kind of fun. So, you know, this fragment, this is the humerus, as a matter of fact. That little pink fragment used to be attached here. So in an avulsion fracture, a fragment of bone is pulled away or separated. A fragment of bone is evolved or torn away. A lot of times, this happens because of a ligament tear. So, chances are, soup to nuts, that this was an ulnar collateral ligament tear. And the ulnar collateral ligament was torn. Ah! And it pulled so hard when it tore the ligament that it pulled a part of the bone with it. And then a spiral fracture is a spiral-shaped fracture or a corkscrew-shaped fracture. What type of force is most likely to result in a spiral fracture? A shearing force. I mean, you can see in this x-ray, we can see that fracture, the line of the bone, is going in this direction. Okay. 
Um, I have some pictures of healing just to show you what it looks like. Sometimes if we have a fracture of small bones or a lot of pieces are kind of shattered, we might benefit from a rod or a screw just to hold the bones together. But ultimately, the rods and the screw aren't doing the healing. It's just putting the bones back together so that they're aligned and then the body can do its own healing. On your notes there, you don't need to know of injuries. You should know osteoporosis. Here we have healthy bone, healthy spongy bone, spongy bone, as I look, obviously looks spongy. Here we have osteoporotic. Man, it's Friday, folks. I really, I'm not doing so well with the spelling. Osteoporotic bone. Osteoporosis is when we have a loss of bone density. It tends to happen in spongy bone first. Instead of the spongy bone being nice and thick, yeah, it's still spongy because there's holes in the middle, but it's nice and thick. Instead of our spongy bone being nice and thick and strong where it needs to be, it's thinner and weaker. Loss of bone density. Now, this is becoming a little bit outdated. Um, so probably in the next time I teach this, I'm going to update it to the new terminology. But I just want to make the point. So while this term might be outdated, there is a particular consideration when it comes to female athletes. And I think it's a useful way to think about it. Okay? What this tells us is that there are three conditions that can be interconnected and that are likely possible to happen in a female athlete. Female athletes, well, let's first start off. Females in general are more likely to have osteoporosis. This, this has to do with estrogen and hormonal differences, but females are more likely to have a loss of bone density. Females are more likely, stats tell us this, females are more likely to have disordered eating patterns. Well, guess what? These can be related. If, if a female, regardless of age, if a female is not eating well, it could negatively impact their bone. If I'm not eating well, my bones are not going to be as dense and strong. So these can be interrelated where one makes the other worse. And then, of course, with females, everything can also relate to the menstrual cycle, right? Right. Have, there, have you heard of, I'm going to probably spell this wrong, amenorrhea? Amenorrhea is a loss of period. I'm not going to ask you that term on the exam, but in case you didn't know, sometimes if there's stress in a female's body, in a female who's already be begun puberty, of course, Sometimes when there's stress in the female's body, too much exercise, not enough food, other stressors, sometimes when the female body is trying to handle a lot of stress, it will purposely shut down the ovaries. It will purposely make the decision that this body is under stress, more energy is needed elsewhere. So the female body will take energy away from the reproductive system and say, you know what, right now we can't afford to send energy to the ovaries and the uterus and all that. I can tell you from my experience, the first Ironman I did, I was training a whole lot, and I lost my period for, I don't know, three or four months. So this might occur during some heavy training. It certainly is something that should bring a little alarm. Um, once I started to correct my diet a little bit, my period came back. But it can also happen, menstrual dysfunction and or loss of periods. It doesn't necessarily have to be a loss of period, but it could be just menstrual dysfunction. But that's also related to bone health and my eating, females eating. So if you're not eating well, that's putting stress on your body, which could lead to menstrual dysfunction. If my bones are of poor health because of exercising too much, not eating enough, that can also lead to menstrual dysfunction. So I think it's useful to point out these three interconnected conditions. Okay, um, I have a lot of information here that's just more general, but there are a couple things that I am going to ask you to know for the test, but I'm going to be very clear. 
So the first point that I'd like to make is, and you know this, folks, in terms of athlete athletics and sports, there's been a trend towards specialization where a person tends to specialize in one sport over the other. Maybe it used to be that more people played three different sports, football, basketball, track, I don't know. But now people are specializing more sooner and they're specializing to a greater degree. This has an effect on body types. So all I'm pointing out is as athletes become more specialized, specializing in only one sport, which means they're only putting a one particular type of stress on their bones and their body. As, they're, as athletes become more specialized, which means that we're limiting the types of stress placed on the bones, as athletes have become more specialized, bones and body types are changing as a result. Especially think about our adolescent athletes. Aren't their bones still growing? So if an athlete specializes really early and is only playing one sport, it could put one, too much of one type of stress on the bones. Think about a baseball pitcher who's 10, who starts throwing curveballs too early. Well, they're putting too much stress on their bones because of the curveball requires a lot of torque that the bones and ligaments can't handle yet. So they're more likely to have ligament tears, which can pull off the bone. Um, a, young, a young tennis player who specializes and goes to, you know, AMG Academy in Florida and plays tennis as part of school and specializes only in that, they're probably going to have greater bone strength, greater bone length, greater bone thickness in their dominant arm of their tennis playing. But these are just points that I'm, that I'm putting that you need to know. I give you some other evidence, like this is some specific, you don't need to know specific data. This is the example I gave. Um, dominant forearm bones grow longer. This might not seem like much. Okay, fine. Um, the forearm is probably, the, the radius and ulna aren't the most important of our bones, but they're still bones. And this could absolutely lead to dysfunction later on. All right. The second point that I want to make, and we're almost done. Thanks for bearing with me. The second point that I want to make is these bone structure changes that may occur are small in terms of measurement. For example, we just gave an example of a quarter of an inch longer growth in the radius and ulna. A quarter inch in the whole scheme of things is not a lot. So by numbers, these changes might seem small. However, small changes in bone structure, that quarter of an inch can actually lead to considerable differences in physiology. If we really want to be simple, we can just say it can lead to really considerable differences in physiology, either for the good or for the bad. So I give you an example. You don't need to know the difference, but look, an um, Olympic shot putter or a discus thrower if they have a heavier skeleton by six pounds, 6.5 pounds, they can actually hold on to 30 more pounds of muscle. So a little bit more in the bones, that number is much smaller, can lead to a significant amount of muscle. So I don't want to minimize these relatively small structural changes over time. A quarter of an inch, small in structural terms, can actually be a bigger change overall. Okay, there are some limits. Um, I give you some examples down below, but you don't need to know those, but I just wanted to give you a couple of examples. Okay, so you don't need to know those, but those are just some examples. I got a little carried away and I went into um, some of these specific bone structure changes. You don't need to know them. Um, in lab next week, we're gonna measure wingspans. We can talk about that. That will, 
Well, actually, let me say one thing about that. We're going to measure wingspan in class. I would like you to be able to define it for our upcoming exam, right? Wingspan is the measure from the end of one fingertip to the end of the other when you have your arms abducted to 90 degrees. What I also want to point out is the ratio of wingspan to height. So what if we compare wingspan, which is the horizontal measure here, to height? We're going to do both of these in lab. The average adult has a ratio of 1 to 1, right? So for example, I'm 5'8 and a half. So that's just about 68 inches. So if my height is 68 inches, it's probably pretty likely that my wingspan is also very close to 68 inches, right? So usually the ratio is one to one. I'd like you to know that. Um, there are some examples where this specialization can help you. Wouldn't a basketball player benefit from a very large wingspan? Back in the day, Nate Robinson, look at his height, short dude, look at his wingspan, right? So this is an example where are volleyball players, right? And it, it, it's in some ways self-selection. People who have that larger wingspan gravitate towards that because they're better anyway at that sport. But for our exam coming up, just be able to define what wingspan is and then what the normal average, I should say average, wingspan is in an adult. Okay, folks. I really want you to do well on this first exam. Review, review, review. Please reach out if you have questions or would like um, some additional help.